It is no news that the majority of cartels operating around the world were formed solely to traffic drugs, but with the continuous creation of new cartels came serious competition in the trafficking business. The stiff competition combined with the government's continuous efforts to mitigate drug trafficking has forced these criminal organizations to seek out other money-making ventures. In this video, I will be revealing five illegal businesses operated by dangerous cartels. 5. Drug Trafficking Drug trafficking, which is often regarded as the primary illegal business operated by cartels, involves carrying, selling, transporting, and importing unlawful controlled substances. The most trafficked drugs include heroin, cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, and fentanyl. Regular prescription drugs can also be trafficked, but many cartels are more interested in hard substances. Over the years, Mexican drug trafficking organizations have become the highest distributors of cocaine, fentanyl, marijuana, and methamphetamine into the United States. While Mexico is in charge of producing methamphetamine and heroin, their counterparts in Colombia hold the reins on cocaine production. Cartels in Mexico and China are the highest producers of fentanyl, an opioid that is about 50 times more potent than heroin. Although the United States has put in place serious security measures to abate the flow of drugs into the country, the cartels have continued to find ways to smuggle and distribute illegal substances without being caught. The various methods of smuggling include using vehicles, boats, drones, aircraft, maritime vessels, underground tunnels, and even humans. While cars, trucks, and boats have been preferred smuggling vessels dating as far back as anyone can remember. Pablo Escobar is said to have been the first person to employ the use of aircraft. In 1970, Pablo smuggled his first shipment of cocaine into the U.S. using a small aircraft. Toward the end of his life, Pablo advanced to using two remote-controlled submarines for his smuggling operations. When being smuggled in vehicles, illegal drugs are hidden in secret compartments. In cars, for example, illegal substances are carefully hidden in the roof, the door panels, the tires, and the gas tank. In extreme cases, drugs have been found in car engines. Aside from road, water, and air transport, cartels also use underground tunnels that span from one country into another to smuggle drugs. As of March 2016, authorities discovered a total of 224 tunnels on the southwest border of the United States. To avoid suspicion, smugglers have also used food trucks and trains to traffic drugs. In these cases, the shipments are carefully wrapped and hidden in crates. On more than one occasion, border authorities have discovered drugs that were painted green to look like watermelons and packed into watermelon crates. While necessity has caused smugglers to devise numerous ways to traffic drugs, one of the oldest and perhaps the most widely used methods of getting drugs across borders is the use of mules. A mule is a person that serves as a courier for cartels. The individual is employed to carry illegal substances across borders so that cartel members do not risk getting caught. Mules typically hide the items being transported on their bodies or in their bodies. The process of smuggling goods using one's body is known as body packing. In body packing, the mule can either attach the contraband items to parts of their body, or they can turn to other means like filling the soles of cut-out shoes and the inside of belts with drugs. Along the line, some cartels decided to take things up a notch. They would intentionally divert the attention of airport security by sending in one or two people to openly carry drugs and keep the airport officials occupied, while several other mules make their way across undetected. This tactic worked for a time, but with the continuous upgrade of security measures, it is no longer used. Or is it? As time passed, cartel bosses grew desperate to send their product out, and so when other means failed, mules began to use their gastrointestinal tracts or other body openings to transport drugs. In this trafficking style, the drugs are properly packaged into tiny balloons before they are swallowed. For extra protection, the little balloons can be made from multiple layers of condoms or multiple layers of latex finger gloves. On each trip, mules ingest dozens of these balloons, and once they cross the border, the drugs are retrieved from their feces or through their vomit. As you probably already know, swallowing insane amounts of hard drugs wrapped in latex is as dangerous as it is time-sensitive. Many mules have had the tiny balloons erupt in their stomachs due to the action of digestive juices. When that happens, the drugs begin to leak into their bloodstreams, and if nothing is done immediately, the individual eventually dies from a drug overdose. Now you're probably wondering why people opt to become mules, seeing how dangerous it is. Well, here's why. Drug lords purposely hire people who are in desperate need of money and are willing to do anything for it. Other times, cartels threaten to harm a person's family or friends if they don't do the the job leaving them no choice. On the part of the cartels, the security risks of using mules are high, and every mule that is caught causes the organization to lose a percentage of their income. With this in mind, many drug lords have turned to a more cost-efficient and easily available means of traffic.
trafficking, drones. Drones are cost efficient in the sense that they are significantly cheaper when compared to the costs of using mules, digging functional tunnels, or even the price of acquiring boats. Drones cost around $5,000 per unit, which is more or less pocket change for these cartels. When cartels started making use of drones, border authorities were informed, but they paid less attention to the news because they thought drones were small and couldn't carry a significant amount of drugs. Smugglers, in turn, used this opportunity to move as much drugs as they could, and it went on for years. The authorities received an eye-opener one night in January 2015 when a drone fell out of the sky in Tijuana, Mexico. Upon inspection, authorities figured out that the drone was designed for filmmaking and photography, but it had been converted into a narcodrone. At the time it fell, the drone was carrying more than six pounds of methamphetamine, worth about $43,000 on the streets. The existence of narco drones continues to favor smugglers because these drones are not easily detected by border authorities. In order to play it safe, some smugglers have developed a means of distracting border patrol officers that involves using one drone to lead them to a fake drop site, while other drones have the opportunity to move across the border safely. Every cartel has its method or route of smuggling illegal drugs, but cartels like the Sinaloa cartel have huge networks in place. Once the cartel's efforts pay off and the drugs get across the border undetected, street gangs divide the shipment and control the retail end of distribution throughout the country. To this day, drug trafficking is said to be one of the most profitable illegal businesses in the crime world, raking in billions each year. 4. Money Laundering You may have heard of the term money laundering and what it means, but the way cartels use it to their gain is an entirely different ballgame. Money laundering is a process by which criminals account for large amounts of the money they make, using legal fronts to avoid questioning or paying taxes. Money made from criminal activities is considered to be dirty because it is ill-gotten, so the next step is to launder said money to make it appear legitimate. Every criminal organization wants nothing more than to comfortably spend their ill-made wealth, hence money laundering is a necessity. In addition to making ill-gotten money appear legitimate, cartel members also have to worry about the dangers of handling huge sums of cash, which include getting caught by the authorities or being robbed by rival cartels. To avoid these dangers, it is imperative for criminals to find a way to deposit their profits into banks or other financial institutions without raising suspicions about their source of income. To launder their money effectively, criminals use these three steps, placement, layering, and integration. During placement, the organization finds a way to inject its dirty money into a legitimate business. This is usually done by dividing a large amount of money into smaller bits as deposits or investments. In the layering stage, the dirty money is used in different legal transactions to cover its original source. This stage involves the use of bookkeeping tricks to keep the owners of the dirty money hidden. For integration, the laundered money is withdrawn from the business through a legitimate account. The now laundered money enters the economy as clean money so that the criminals can use it for whatever they wish. Let me paint a typical example of money laundering in cartels. Say, a cartel member receives his profits from selling drugs and wants to buy a new house. He knows that paying for the house in cash will raise suspicions, so he doesn't do that. Instead, he pumps the dirty money into a small laundry shop he owns. The money is gradually mixed with the legitimate profit made by the shop and is then deposited into the bank. After a few weeks of circulation, the cartel member withdraws the now clean money from the laundry shop's account. This way, he doesn't raise suspicion when buying the house because, to the public, the money he is paying with was generated legitimately by his laundry shop. A cartel member may also walk into a casino with his dirty cash and use it to buy chips that he doesn't even bother to gamble with. At the end of the night, he gets his money back in a check instead of cash. The money gotten from cashing that check is clean, so he can use it for anything. Businesses used for the purpose of cleaning dirty money are called fronts. While these fronts give criminal organizations the freedom they need to spend their money, they also rake in substantial amounts of money for the organization. There are three basic types of money laundering that criminals use. These are smurfs, mules, and shells. A smurf is a money launderer whose major aim is to avoid scrutiny from government agencies. Using the three steps of money laundering, placement, layering, and integration, the smurf can successfully mask his money from the government. Most times, large amounts of money are split into smaller chunks and deposited into different bank accounts. The smurf makes sure none of the bank transactions is large enough to alert the authorities. For example, a particular jurisdiction may have a transaction limit of $20,000. In this case, any transaction above that limit will attract the attention of financial regulators. Keeping this in mind, the smurf makes different small transactions and successfully remains under the radar. As I said earlier, mules are people who provide transport for illegal goods or substances, and the same theory applies here. Mules are hired by criminal organizations to help them launder money. All the mules need to do is open different bank accounts with different banks and deposit the money given to them by the cartels. When they have achieved this, the cartel members go ahead to move the money from one account to another. This string of transactions makes 
it appear as though the money is being used for one business or another. After a while of bouncing the funds into different accounts, the money is now considered clean and can easily be withdrawn. So many individuals hired as mules by these organizations are innocent people who have no criminal records and are most times unaware of the magnitude of the money laundering scheme they are to participate in. The use of shells is perhaps the most popular method of money laundering today. Shell corporations are companies that do not have any physical employees, business activities, operations, or assets. They are mostly useful for raising money, which is in turn used to finance a merger or the acquisition of a startup company. The corporations exist only on paper and are operated in a way that is very beneficial to money launderers. Cartels use shell corporations to hide their illegal wealth and skip paying taxes. It goes without saying that every cartel is involved in one form of money laundering or another. Laundromats, diners, small convenience stores, and clubs all serve as fronts for illegal movement of cash. As an added bonus, the fronts also take in money for the criminal groups. While nearly all cartels turn to money laundering at one point or the other, the Sinaloa cartel stands out for having a well-established and complex money laundering system. This system involves methods like moving money across international borders to avoid detection and using front companies to conduct transactions. One of such money laundering organizations used by the Sinaloa cartel was discovered by the FBI sometime in 2020. The carefully established criminal organization allegedly led by Enrique Daan Esparagoza Rosas of Culiacan, Sinaloa, Mexico, used a network of shell companies incorporated in Wyoming to launder millions of dollars in cash on behalf of the notorious cartel. The discovery and disruption of Esparagoza's operations is indeed a step in the right direction, but the reality is that law enforcement agencies have a long way to go. 3. Kidnapping, Racketeering, and Extortion Cartels are famous for kidnapping their enemies or anyone who dares to stand in their way. Those kidnapped for these reasons are either killed or punished as an example to others. Away from being a means of doling out warnings and punishment, there is yet another side to kidnapping, one that is lucrative. On the lucrative side of kidnapping, cartels abduct a person and inform their families or loved ones that they would have to pay a ransom in order to get them back. In recent times, these criminal organizations have devised a more structured means of carrying out their kidnapping operations. First, they kidnap little children, torture them, and extract information about rich people and families in their communities, potential ransom payers. The information obtained is used to plan attacks on these rich people and subsequently, members of said rich family or the entire family are taken and held hostage. The victims are either killed or set free, and it all depends on if the ransom is paid. Another way cartels identify potential victims is by targeting migrants trying to cross the border into the US. Each cartel has carefully positioned spies known as hawks who hang around in the streets and at bus stations. Sometimes, these spies even go as far as sneaking into NGO-owned migrant shelters. Once they are in position, the Hawks select possible targets and report back to the cartels. The targets are then kidnapped at gunpoint and taken to secret hideouts, where they are searched and stripped of their personal effects. Next, their families are contacted. The abductors take pictures of the victims and send the images to their loved ones as an incentive to pay the ransom. Some cartels have also been known to beat, rape, and at worst, kill their victims. When cartels are not kidnapping and demanding ransom from individuals, and families, they turn to extorting money from business owners. As far as businesses are concerned, extortion can be done in one of two ways, the first of which is racketeering. A racket is an illegal and fraudulent activity that is usually done by extortion or intimidation for the sole purpose of making a profit. In Mexico, brutal cartels like the CJN impose protection rackets on business owners, and this illegal business model is replicated around the world. In protection rackets, business owners in a particular location are forced to pay a certain amount of money to a cartel operating in the area area in exchange for protection from harm that could be caused by members of the cartel itself or other rival cartels. Any business owner who fails to comply ends up losing their goods either to looters or to cartel members. This serves as punishment for their refusal to pay. In 1970, the United States signed into law the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act, RICO. RICO contains a list of 35 umbrella offenses, which include bribery, fraud, gambling offenses, money laundering, financial and economic crimes, obstructing justice, or a criminal investigation, murder for hire, arson, robbery, and extortion. Anyone found committing any of these crimes would be charged under the RICO Act. Cartels have been involved in various forms of racketeering for the longest time, and the RICO Act was introduced to help the government arrest and 
prosecute them, the New York's famous five families, Bonanno, Lucchese, Gambino, Genovese, and Colombo families, received serious fire from RICO due to their involvement in racketeering. The Federal Bureau of Investigation cracked down on 125 members of the mob in January 2011, making it one of the largest single-day attacks against the mob in history. Where cartels are not running protection rackets, they engage in outright extortion, which involves attaching heavy levies on businesses, and the business owners are forced to pay as a result of fear. All kinds of businesses, from petty stalls to high-end businesses like restaurants and hotels, are targeted. A member of the National Public Security Council, James Tobin, says that cartel extortion is a widespread menace. Cartels charge small business owners about $10 per day, and the owners of larger businesses are made to pay anywhere between $1,200 to $4,900 per day. The Sinaloa Cartel, CJNG, and a group called the Polonies are the most powerful criminal organizations in the country that make millions from extortion. There have also been records of random criminals extorting businesses under the guise of being cartel members. The use of brute violence by cartels leaves business owners with no choice but to pay the exorbitant charges imposed on them. Kidnapping and extortion are a major source of income for many cartels, and these criminal groups use the funds obtained from these means to stock up on military-grade weapons that give them the upper hand in gang wars or wars against the government. Extortion in Mexico has led to the temporary or complete shutdown of several companies. In 2018, a Canadian mining company based in Mexico halted all operations in its largest mine near Madera Municipality in Chihuahua State. The decision to halt operations was made due to the fact that the cartels had built checkpoints around the mine. The workers kept getting harassed and assaulted each day by cartel members, but the final straw that broke the company was the discovery of a decapitated body near the mine. The company's owners decided that the workers' lives were in real danger, and it was better to end all operations in the mine. In May 2018, cartel gunmen opened fire on workers at one of Mexico's largest bottling plants in Guerrero State. The workers were trying to reopen the plant that hadn't been functioning since January that year, when the incident occurred. The company had ceased to function a few months prior due to extortion threats from cartels, but after the shooting incident, the company was completely shut down. Amidst all of these, there seems to be a silver lining because the existence of the RICO Act has helped the government in the fight against racketeering and extortion, although there are still cartels that engage in the business. For example, CJNG, Los Zetas, and Sinaloa Cartel still run protection rackets to date. 2. Sex trafficking and people smuggling Another illegal yet lucrative business cartels have ventured into is human or sex trafficking. Sex trafficking may be seen as a form of modern-day slavery because people are recruited, transported, and forced into having non-consensual sex for the gain of the traffickers. Judging by the number of cartels in Mexico, it is not shocking to learn that the country is one of the most well-known starting points, passageways, and destinations for sex trafficking. It is estimated that sex traffickers make about $150 billion a year globally. In Mexico, human trafficking is so widespread that it is considered to be the third largest illegal activity after the drug and gun trade. According to Santiago Nieto, the head of Mexico's Financial Intelligence Unit, many Mexican cartels are venturing into the trafficking business, especially groups facing a downturn in their primary business. Cartels like Los Zetas not only run human trafficking chains, but they also control networks through which other gangs move their victims. The situation of human trafficking in Mexico is worsened by the fact that corruption is deep in the heart of the government. Many police officers and government officials have been caught accepting bribes in exchange for turning a blind eye to the activities of traffickers. As far as sex trafficking goes, no one is safe because these traffickers prey on both locals and foreigners. However, young women, children, people with disabilities, members of the LGBTQ community, and naive immigrants are the most targeted people. Several men have also met this fate. Some victims of sex traffickers are deceived into thinking they are being transported to a new location where they can secure well-paying jobs, while others are outrightly abducted. Traffickers often pick up their victims from poor communities where the populace is not educated. They sweet-talk their victims into leaving home in search of greener pastures, and they also make empty promises of a better life to the victim's family. These families hang on to the words of the trafficker and encourage their children to make the trip, completely unaware of the imminent danger. As they leave home, the soon-to-be victims are filled with hopes and dreams, only for them to be crushed by their new reality. Upon reaching their destination, victims are kept in chains in places that are less than conducive for human habitation and are only let out when being taken to brothels, bars,
bars and hotels to meet men who pay for their services. After being captured, victims of trafficking are locked up, used, and abused for years until they either escape or die. And it is worth noting that only a few people make it out alive. The few people who escape from sex traffickers choose to hide behind masks of anonymity for fear of being judged. However, some victims like Marcella have come out to share their stories. In 2013, Marcella spoke about her ordeal with sex traffickers. When she was 16, she met a supposedly wealthy businessman who claimed to love her and wished to marry her. He proposed to her, promised to give her a comfortable lifestyle, and took her from her hometown in Veracruz. Marcella's husband-to-be took her to the Merced neighborhood in Mexico City, a place famously known to be a hotspot for prostitution. On reaching the city, Marcella was forced to remain in a hotel room where she encountered up to 40 men daily. Each man paid $15 to her supposed lover. After a week in captivity, Marcella was lucky enough to be rescued when the hotel was raided by the police. When her captors were apprehended, Marcella received numerous threats in an attempt to scare her into silence, but she stood her ground and went on to testify against them in court. Marcella is one of the thousands of girls that have been trafficked and was lucky enough to escape it. The few people that have survived sex trafficking ended up with mental health issues, sexually transmitted diseases, and even opioid addictions. They often find it difficult to lead normal lives, and that in turn affects their interaction with their families and the society at large. It remains extremely difficult to measure the real extent of sex trafficking in Mexico due to poor record keeping and the secretive nature of the business. In 2019, the Mexican government recorded a total of 658 victims of human trafficking, but it's safe to say that the actual number may be significantly higher. To this day, all efforts made by the government to end human trafficking are considered insufficient. People smuggling is a term that is often mistaken for human trafficking for a lot of reasons, and one of them is that the majority of cartels that are involved in human trafficking are also involved in people smuggling. Notwithstanding, there is a significant difference between the two. People smuggling involves the illegal movement of migrants into countries around the world, and the major difference between people smuggling and human trafficking is that in people smuggling, the migrants give their consent to the person or organization that smuggles them. Unlike human trafficking, these emigrants pay for this service and are willing to endure whatever circumstances it takes to get to their destination. Individuals that pay to be smuggled do so to escape poverty and are often in search of employment, opportunities, and an escape from hardship. Some even leave home to seek asylum. Despite their differences, human trafficking and people smuggling share quite a few similarities, one of which is the inhumane mode of transportation. Sometimes, the emigrants who are being smuggled end up facing starvation, threats, abuse, and torture from the smugglers. At this point, they have already paid for the service and have no choice but to endure the hardship while hoping to reach their destinations alive. As more people seek to be smuggled, the price of the service continues to increase. The cost of being smuggled varies depending on the smuggler and the emigrant's choice of destination. Smugglers charge up to $4,000 to move emigrants across borders like from Mexico into the United States. But when the destinations involve trans-Pacific crossings, like from China into the United States, the cost is as high as $75,000. The outrageous prices people pay to be smuggled are greatly influenced by the increasing complexity of smuggling operations. Many nations now have stronger security, and so while the money is attractive to the men of the underworld, it is risky. In 2003, Mexican smugglers made over $5 billion from smuggling migrants into the United States. Decades later, it's safe to say that this figure has increased significantly. In the European Union, smugglers are estimated to make about 4 billion euros per year. In the smuggling business, there are major operators known as snakeheads and minor operators called coyotes. The major operators or snakeheads are smugglers, whose major business is transporting Chinese emigrants into Western countries, especially the United States. The name snakehead originated from the fact that the lines of emigrants seeking to be smuggled are so long they can be likened to snakes. Despite their dangerous nature, the individuals who patronize snakeheads regard them as resourceful guides. Minor operators or coyotes are smugglers who transport people from Mexico into the United States or from Bolivia into Chile. Coyotes generally charge less than snakeheads since they cover relatively shorter distances. In recent times, the dangers of human trafficking and employing the services of people smugglers are being widely publicized in an attempt to curb these operations. In response to this, the smugglers and traffickers are turning to more drastic measures to keep their businesses running. 1. Oil theft 
Mexicans refer to any person or group of people who indulge in the theft and sale of fuel, diesel, and other petroleum products as a huachicolero or guachicolero. Around 2010, Mexico's state oil company Pemex was hit with a drastic increase in oil theft and the perpetrators were cartels who were diversifying their business. The height of these thefts happened within an area known as the Triangulo Rojo, or Red Triangle. The Red Triangle encompasses different municipalities in Puebla State, including Topeka, Palma de Bravo, Quecholac, Acatzingo, Acachete, and Tecamachalco. Huachicoleros activities in the Red Triangle increased because 40% of the fuel distributed from Mexico City to the rest of the country passes through the region. In the last decade, cartel members have been known to threaten or torture workers at various oil refineries to obtain information on which underground pipes contained fuel and when the fuel would be pumped. With this information, the cartel members would tap into several pipelines at the right time and steal as much fuel as possible. The rise in the price of fuel only served as motivation for the cartels to intensify their oil theft operations because they now had more to gain. There are reports that when harassing workers doesn't work, these organized crime groups use threats of violence or bribes to corrupt government officials who in turn feed them the information they need to carry out the thefts. Investigators believe that some officials within Pemex also help these criminal groups and get a cut from the illegal sale of stolen fuel as payment for their services. The stolen fuel is sold on the black market for a cheaper price and so many impoverished communities willingly patronize the cartels. Members of these poor communities are also more than willing to take up jobs as lookouts or fuel carriers. The rate of pipeline perforations increased from 28 perforations per day in 2017 to 40 perforations per day in 2018. A total of 12,581 illegal perforations of pipelines were recorded all over Mexico in the first few months of 2018. That same year, it was estimated that Mexico's national oil company was losing about 74,000 barrels of crude oil daily to huachicoleros. Each year, oil theft operations rake in a significant amount of money for dangerous cartels. In fact, at one point, cartels were estimated to be making up to $400 million annually from oil theft. While these criminal groups were making millions in profit, the government was losing money trying to block pipeline perforations. Despite their best attempts, the police could not fight off the huachicoleros on their own, and since the situation was getting out of hand, the Mexican army had to step in. In recent times, there have been records of violent altercations between oil oil thieves and the authorities. In March 2017, the city of Cuesta Blanca in Puebla witnessed an exchange of violence between huachicoleros and military officials. The officials were patrolling the surrounding area when they caught a group of huachicoleros with about nine units of stolen fuel. The gang immediately opened fire and the military personnel had to retaliate. The shootout ended with two members of the gang injured and arrested. The gang led by Roberto El Bucanas is said to be affiliated with the Zetas cartel. In May of that year, another shootout between huachicoleros and military officers occurred in Palmarito Tocapan in Puebla State. The shootout resulted in the deaths of two military officers and one officer was injured. Leading up to the shootout, the officers discovered the huachicoleros with several units of stolen fuel. The criminals immediately opened fire and the officers were caught off guard. Said huachicoleros were able to escape the scene by using women and children as human shields. In response to the oil theft menace, the Mexican government implemented strict security measures in the country. In addition to that, the Mexican Congress came together to approve a legislation reform that increases the sentence for convicted oil thieves to 25 years in prison with a fine of 2 million pesos. More efforts to stop oil thieves came from President Andres Manuel López Obrador, who became president in December 2018. Presidential Obrador discovered that some gangs had built warehouses over pipelines from which they could easily access the pipelines and tap into them. Hence, in addition to added security, the president came up with a way to stop huachicoleros by shutting off a pipeline from the Salamanca refinery in the central state of Guanajuato, and oil companies turned to use tanker trucks for the distribution of fuel throughout the country. Luckily for the people of Mexico, the closure of the pipeline did yield positive results. The incidence of oil thefts reduced drastically, but it caused a shortage of gasoline across different states in the first few weeks of 2019. Aside from the reduction in the country's income caused by oil thefts, oil thieves also ended up starting oil fires on more than one occasion due to the volatility of gasoline. Mexico has recorded several oil explosions caused by oil thieves. In December, December 2010, 29 people lost their lives in an explosion in San Martin, and about 137 people died in the January 2019 explosion in Hidalgo. Despite the dangers involved, oil theft continues to exist in Mexico to date. The Sinaloa cartel and CJNG are among the top cartels that continue to run oil theft operations, proving that cartel members are willing to risk anything including their lives as long as they make money. As the years go by, the government continues to make efforts to crack down on cartels and effectively put an end 
end to their illegal businesses, but it seems it'll take the authorities a few more years to achieve their goal. Click on the cards showing on your screen for more videos exposing cartels.